Cloud. So, um, Michael, you are the head of Soteria. So oh, I, I've never considered myself really head of Soteria. It's that nice of you to say that. But anyway, uh, um, yeah, yeah gr great welcome to everybody, of course. This is our third uh, meeting. And I sometimes think that if you have a society or group and you manage to get to the third, it's a very good sign because a lot of organizations, a lot of groups and a lot of magazines and publications shoot off and fall after the number two, that seems to me anyway, the case. So it's uh, very heartening to see at our third meeting, so many people appearing. Great welcome to Daniel there from somewhere in Germany who invited at the last moment. Daniel wrote rather an informative and very clear piece on James Joyce, which is why I got in contact with him. And um, I can't say any more than that. It's very great. Welcome to everybody. To remind people again, when I send out this newsletter, the times we meet is not written in stone. If you feel strongly that another time or day is more convenient, and please, please let me know. And uh, I think it's over to Stead to introduce a subject which certainly interests me. And I, I got the impression from receiving a number of mails that uh, most of us don't know much about him, if he even existed. And uh, over to Stead. Thank you. Well, welcome, everyone. Uh, welcome, uh, Catherine. I see you've just joined. Hello. Um, unlike in the first two meetings, I've decided to preface the readings with only a short introduction, which allows us time to read a more sizable, continuous narrative of the work if we had the <laughs> stomach for it, or to do something else if we uh, don't wish to continue. This writing I found difficult to gain traction upon, and it may be beneficial to read a longer passage to acclimatize <clears throat> one's sensibility. There is a three part poem of which we shall read the first part and then an extract from another poem of a different style within the collection for contrast. Um, after having read these two extracts, I shall ask whether we do have the stomach to read parts uh, two and three of the first poem. If not, then I should say a few words and we can discuss what we've read. I, I would ask everyone to bear the subtitle of today's meeting in mind. How, how good are these works? Uh, uh, and we can discuss it afterwards. For all the extracts, I've added in bold the names of the speakers to aid in the understanding of the narrative Sometimes, however, it's, uh, it's not clear who is speaking since the poems of Ossian are supposed to be the vividly dramatized uh, internal reflections of Ossian. He was uh, always supposed to be the aged blind bard um, in Celtic myth, the son of Finn McCall uh, and the father of Fingal, one of the heroes of the collection. Does anyone mem remember seeing the film being there with the main role, that of the innocent simpleton gardener who by an accidental association with powerful people after he is injured by a rich man's car, ends up being chosen to become the next president of the United States? Anyone, you know, put your hand up if you know, know the film. Well, a couple of people. Um, um, yeah, I do have a clip lined up, but may, maybe uh, you know, maybe we should use our time in another another way. Uh, th this most sympathetic and engaging character that Peter Tell has created, or so it seemed to me, um, uh, it was played, as I said, by Peter Sellers, that master of uh, so many different voices. Uh, 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 with, uh, without meaning any disrespect to him, I, I find myself much more attracted to the characters he created than to him personally. And I think this phenomenon is well attested, that of actors who in their stage persona are people of surpassing power and appeal, but who in their private lives are people riven with flaws. And I wonder whether the phenomenon prevails also in other arts. Let's go to this.
meninas. Ah. Well known. I think most people would acknowledge the beauty of that piece, which I, I hope uh, some of you recognise as it's, as it's very, very well known, um, which in the rubric of the video is ascribed to the Baroque composer Tommaso Albinoni. It was first published in 1958 by the musicologist Remo Gazziotto with the claim that it was the orchestrated form of a fragment which he had discovered in the Saxon State Library in Dresden. But later, um, he claimed it as an original composition and registered a copyright for it. I'm not aware of anything else he composed. And although the matter is still somewhat disputed, complicated by the uh, uh, revenue generated by this popular piece, um, one possible interpretation is that it was only under the guise of someone more famous and with a distinctive style that he was able to produce something good himself. One could also adduce the short pieces that the violinist uh, Fritz Kreisler played as encores, which became very popular and which he initially claimed to be by a variety of other minor luminaries and only later admitted to their authorship. He did go on to write other pieces under his own name, none of which I think I've ever heard. And whether this is deserved or not, may, one may not judge without evidence, but it, the fact may be that they are less played because they are less felicitous. But perhaps the most currently played piece he wrote in, uh, it is in this genre of the pastiche or of work in someone else's style. And that is the cadenzas he wrote for the violin concerto by Beethoven. Um, and I understand that these cadenzas are still the most uh, commonly played. A cadenza being a passage in a notated piece of classical music where the performer is asked to improvise, typically occurring in a concerto. This preamble assumes that Anyone who has heard of the poems of Ossian will have heard them in connection with what has been described as the greatest literary forgery of all time. The case is similar to that of the Albinoni in that the man James McPherson, who put his name to the published collection as their purported translator out of the Gaelic, claimed the poems were based on fragments, but he did not supply anything to substantiate this when asked to. And unlike the musicologist, he never changed his claim to that of full authorship. The poems, however, do have some basis in Gaelic ballads, as was demonstrated by Derek Thompson in his book in 1952, written when he was professor of Celtic at Glasgow University. But upon this base, Macpherson constructed what he thought antique poetry of this type should be like after the sensibility of the time and he changed and added material freely to this end. One may note two issues here. One is the artistic authenticity or lack of it when a poem tries, when a poet rather tries to fashion the expression of what he himself does not directly wish to express, wishing instead only to give the impression 
of so doing under the pretense of being someone else. The other is the dissimulation if he lies about this. In answer to the first, I hope that the examples I've given for music and acting have made the case that a fine work can be made by someone under the persona of another. So there's no reason why these poems cannot still be worth reading. In answer to the second, yes, lying is not the most attractive practice, but to, uh, but writers are bottom human beings. And to quote Hagemol, even the best are not without flaws. The purity of the lotus can flower in the dirtiest clump of mud. What I was keen to do in preparing for this meeting of Sotiria was to try to taste with an unprejudiced palate that wine under the Ossian label that calls Thomas Jefferson, the polymathic principal author of the American Declaration of Independence and third president of his country to write in 1773 to the family of James McPherson gushingly, these pieces have been and will I think during my life continue to be to me the sources of daily and exalted pleasures. The tender and sublime emotions of the mind were never before so wrought up by the human hand. I'm not ashamed to own that I think this rude bard of the North, the greatest poet that has ever existed. Uh, and I, th I think this uh, opinion is not eccentrically unrepresentative of that wave of regard for Ossian that swept across the Western world. So Walter Scott said of Fingal, one of the characters in the poems whom we shall be encountering later, that he combined all the strength and bravery of Achilles with the courtesy, sentiment and high breeding of Sir Charles Grandison, the latter being a character created in a novel by James, by Samuel Richardson, specifically to depict a virtuous man. Four more facts. The poems of Ossian were said to be Napoleon's favorite book. One of the most popular pieces by Mendelssohn, the Ebrides Overture is subtitled Fingal's Cave. The female name, Fiona, uh, apparently was invented by Macpherson, who himself was honored with being buried in Westminster Abbey. Are these works a relatively bare hook onto which people of the late 18th century hung their various desires to believe in the nobility of those who pre predated the refinements and restrictions which in their way these people were themselves in reaction against? The Albanoni, which we've heard a, a brief extract from earlier, is not uh, a bare hook, and it has sustained its place in the popular repertoire. My mother was very fond of it, and it was played at her funeral. The poems, on the other hand, have sunk almost without contemporary trace. I have not seen one in any anthology, nor have I heard one read on any occasion. Uh, I've not had access any notated edition of the poems, if there is any such that is able by explanatory notes to illuminate them, but I've read them direct without any editorial intermediary, which is how I assume they were originally read when first published and when they first took the word by storm. So let us do that and uh, start our reading. First extract now, uh, I shall read what is called the argument. Uh, and th this, I, I, would, I would ask everyone to try to attend to the details quite carefully because it's not easy to follow uh, when the drama starts going. Fingal, when very young, making a voyage to the Orkney Islands, was driven by stress of weather into a bay of Scandinavia near the residence of Starno, king of Lochlin. Starno invites Fingal to a feast. Fingal, 
doubting the faith of the king and mindful of a former breach of hospitality, refuses to go. Stano gathers together his tribes. Fingal resolves to defend himself. Night coming on, Duth Maruno proposes to Fingal to observe the motions of the enemy. The king himself undertakes the watch. Advancing towards the enemy, he accidentally comes to the cave of Tuothor, where Stano had confined Con Ban Kagla, the captive daughter of a neighboring chief. The story is imperfect, a part of the original being lost. Fingal comes to a place of worship where Stano and his son Swallen consulted the spirit of Loda concerning the issue of war. The encounter of Fingal and Swallen. Duan first concludes with a description of the airy hall of Kruth Loda, supposed to be the Odin of Scandinavia. Duan is apparently um, a term for a poem like Canto. So I think, uh, Frank, please launch us upon this. The tale of the times of old. Why, thou wanderer unseen, thou bender of Thistle Lura, why, thou breeze of a valley, as thou left mine ear? I hear no distant roar of streams. No sound of the harp from the rock. Come, thou huntress of Luther Malvina, call back his soul to the bar, and look forward to Loch Lino Lakes, to a dark billowy bay of Uthorno, where Fingal descends from ocean from the roar of winds. Few of the heroes of Morven in the land are known. Starno sent a dwell of Loda to bid Fingal to the feast. But the king remembered the past, and all his rage arose. Nor Gormel, Gormel's mossy towers, no, nor Starno, shall Fingal behold. Death's wander like shadows over his fiery soul. Do I forget that beam of light, the white-handed daughter of kings? Go, son of Loda. His words are wind to Fingal, wind that to and fro drives the thistle in an in autumn's dusky veil. Duth Maruno, arm of death, chroma glass of iron shields. Thruthmor, dweller of battle's wings. Chromar, whose ships bound on seas, careless as the course of a meteor, on dark rolling clouds. Arise around me, children of heroes, in a land unknown. Let each look on his shield like Trenmor, the ruler of wars. Stefan, the Trenmore. Oh, it's my... <clears throat> Calm down. <laughs> Thus Trenmore said. Thou jeweler between the halves, thou shalt roll this stream away, or who asked with me in earth. Around the king they rise in wrath. No words come forth, they seize their spears, each soul is rolled into itself. At length the sudden clang is waked on all the aching shields. Each takes his hill by night, at intervals they darkly stand. An equal bursts the hum of songs between the roaring wind. Broad over them rose the moon. In his arms came tall Dash Maruno, he from Chrome of Rocks, stern hunter of a boar. In his dark boat he rose on waves. When Cramthorno awaked his woods, in the chase he shone among foes. No fear was thine, Dash Maruno. Michael from London, please. O oh, son of Darien Comhall, shall my steps be forward through night? From the shield shall I view them o'er, over their gleaming tribes? Starno, king of lakes, is before me as far in the foe strangers. Their words are not vain by Lodi's, Lotus Stone of Power. Should Doth Marino not return? His spouse is lonely at home, where he meet two roaring streams on Krath Mokralo's plain. 
Around our hills with echoing woods, the ocean is rolling near. My son looks on screaming sea fowl, a young wanderer on the field. Give the head of a boar to Condona. Tell him of his father's joy when the bristly strength of Euthorno rolled on his lifted spear. Tell him of my deeds and war. Tell where his father fell. Not forgetful of my father's. Dead, Fingal. I have bounded over the seas. Theirs were the times of danger in the days of old. Nor settles darkness on me before foes, though youthful in my locks. Chief of Kratha Mokraumo, the field of night is mine. Fingal rushed in all his arms, wide bounding over Thurtle stream, the scent is sullen roar by night through Gormo's misty vale. A moonbeam glittered on a rock. In the midst stood a stately form, a form with floating locks, like Lochlin's white bosom maids. An equal are her steps and short. She throws a broken song on wind. At times she tosses her white arms, for grief is dwelling in her soul. Carl Torno of aged locks. He said, Where now are thy steps by Lulan? Thou hast failed at thine own dark streams, father of Conban Kagla. But I behold thee, chief of Lulan, sporting by Lodas Hall, when the dark skirted night is rolled along the sky. Thou sometimes hidest the moon with thy shield. I have seen her dim in heaven. Thou kindlest thy hair into meteors and sailest along the night. Why am I forgot in my cave, king of shaggy boars? Look from the hall of Loda on thy lonely daughter. Who art thou? said Fingal. Voice of night? Oh no, yes, sir. She trembling turned away. Who art thou in thy darkness? She shrunk into the cave. The king loosed the thong from her hands. He asked about her father's. Torkul Torno, she said. Once dwelt at Lulan's foamy stream. He dwelt, but now in Lodas Hall, he shakes the sounding shell. He met Starno of Lochlan in war. Long fought the dark-eyed kings. My father fell. In his blood, blue shielded Torkel Torno. By a rock at Ulan stream, I had pierced the bounding row. My white hand gathered my hair from off the rushing winds. I heard a noise. My eyes were up. My soft breast rose on high. My step was forward at Ulan to meet thee, Torkel Torno. It was Starno, dreadful king. His red eyes rolled on me in love. Dark waved his shaggy brow above his gathered smile. Where is my father? I said, he that was mighty in war. Thou art left alone among foes, O daughter of Torkel Torno. He took my hand. He raised the sail. In this cave he placed me dark. At times he comes a gathered mist. He lifts before me my father's shield but often passes a beam of youth far distant from my cave. The son of Starno moves in my sight. He dwells lonely in my soul. Maid of Lulan, said Fingal. White-handed daughter of grief, a cloud marked with streaks of fire is rolled along my soul. Look not to that dark-robed moon. Look not to those meteors of heaven. My gleaming steel is around thee the terror of my foes. It is not the steel of the feeble, nor of the dark in soul. The maids are not shut, shut in our caves of streams. They toss not their white arms alone. They bend fair within their locks, above the harps of Selma. Their voice is not in the desert wild. We melt along the pleasing sound. Fingal again advances steps wide through the bosom of the night, to where the trees of Loda shook amid squally winds. Three stones with heads of moss are there, a stream with foaming course, 
and dreadful rolled around them is the dark red cloud of Loda. High from its top look forward a ghost, half formed of a shadowy stroke. He poured his voice at times amidst the roaring stream. Near, bending beneath a blasted tree, two heroes received his words, sword on our lakes and star no foe strangers. On their dawn shields they darkly leaned, the spears are forward through night, shrill sounds of blast of darkness, a starless floating beer. They heard the tread of Fingal, the warriors rose in arms. Waran, lay that wanderer low, said Starno in his pride. Take the shield of thy father, it is a rock in war. Swaran threw his gleaming spear, he stood fixed in Loda's tree. Then came the foes forward with swords, they mixed their rattling steel. Through the thongs of Swaran's shield rushed the blade of Luna. The shield fell rolling on earth, cleft the helmet fell down. Fingers stopped the lifted steel, Rossel stood Swaran unarmed. He rolled his silent eyes, he threw his sword on earth. And slowly, stalking over the stream, he whistled as he went. Nor unseen of his father is sworn, stern no turns away wrath. His shaggy brows were dark about, above his gathering rage. He strikes Loda's tree with his spear, he raises the hum of songs. They come to the host of Lochlin, each in his own dark path like two foam-covered streams from two rainy vales. To Thunos play, Fingal returned. Fair rose a beam of the east, he shone on the spoils of Lochlin in the hand of the king. From her cave came forth in her beauty the daughter of Tolko Turno. She gathered her hair from wind, she wildly raised her song. The song of Lulan of shells, where once her father dwelt. She saw Starno's bloody shield. Gladness rose a light on her face. She saw the cleft helmet of Swaran. She shrunk darkened from Fingal. Art thou fallen by thy hundred streams, O love of the mournful maid? You saw no world rises in waters, on whose side are the meteors of night? And behold the dark moon descending Baha'i by resounding woods. On thy top dwells a misty loader, the house of the spirits of men. In the end, his cloud, his cloudy hall bends forward, cruise loader of swords. His form is dimly seen amid his waving mist. His right hand is on his shield, in his left is the half of viewless shell. The roof of his dreadful hall is marked with nighty fires. The race of Cruthlord advance, a ridge of formless shades, in reaches a sandy shell to those of Shawnee War. But between him and the feeble, his shield arises a darkened orb. He's, he's a setting meteor to the weak in arms, bright as a rainbow streams, came Lulan's white bosom made. I'm quite taken aback by the life that everyone has been able to endow this uh, aged uh, text with. I mean, just highly agree with you. Wound. I mean, I, I you know, I'm quite overcome. I, uh, if if people don't mind, um, I, uh, 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 Father Frank, would, would you would you mind go, carrying on as Ossian because you seem to have really got into it so I, well? I, I couldn't compete, Stan. That, that is really yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. It, it, it's it, a little it, bit intense, like me. <laughs> uh, right. Now we, uh, yeah, this is a slightly different style. Um, the foretelling, I'll read the, 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 yeah, just a brief description. Uh, Med has assembled a force to go north in the search for a valuable bull, which she's ready to take by force. Before leaving, she sees a woman whom she asks to make prophecy. Med uh, counters the mm. inauspicious prophecy with what she thinks she knows of the strength of the force that will be confronting them, much of which will be paralyzed by period pains inflicted upon them by a goddess whom they have offended. 
When Medbuck was come to the place where his druid was, she craved light and augury of him. Edith, this is your second role. I, I, I... Oh, I thought someone else was going to do Med. Oh, um, yeah, um, Catherine, yeah, Catherine, do you, would you fancy being Med? Okay, many there be. Says Med. Who, who do part with their kinsmen and, kinsmen and friends here today? And from their homes and their lands, from father and from mother, and unless unscathed, everyone shall return. Upon me will they cast their sighs in their ban, for it is I that have assembled this levy. Yet there goeth forth, <laughs> nor stayeth there at home any dearer to me than are we to ourselves. And do thou discover for us whether we ourselves shall return, or whether we shall never return. And the druid made answer. Whatever comes not to thyself shall come. Uh, wait then. Speak of a charioteer. I think I'm doing both. Um, who's charioteer? Oh, I see. Um, yeah, I see. yeah, uh, yeah, sorry, that was my answer. Um, I'm the charioteer. Wait then. Uh, speak the charioteer. <laughs> Let me wheel the chariot by the right. That thus the power of a good omen may arise, that may we will we return again. Then the charioteer wheeled his chariot round, and Medba went back again. When she espied a thing to surprise her, a lone virgin of marriage would age, standing on the hind pole of a chariot a little way off, drawing nigh her, and thus the maiden appeared. Weaving lace was she. In her right hand there was a bordering rod of silver bronze with seven strips of red gold of a size, a many spotted green mantle around her, a bulging strong-headed pin of gold in the mantle of her bosom, a hooded tunic with red interweaving above her, a ruddy fair face countenance she had, narrow below and broad above. She had a blue-gray and laughing eye, each eye their three pupils. Dark and black were high brows, the soft black lashes for a shadow to the middle of her cheeks. Red and thin were her lips, shiny and pearly were her teeth. Thou wouldst believe there were showers of white pearls that had rained into her head. Like to fresh Parthian crimson were her lips, as sweet as the strings of lutes when long sustained they are played by master player's hands, was the melodious sound of her voice and her fair speech. As white as snow in one night fallen was the sheen of her skin, her body was shone outside her dress. Slender and very white were her feet, rosy, even sharp round nails she had, two sandals with golden buckles above them. Fair yellow, long, golden hair she wore, Three braids of her hair she wore, two tresses were wound around her head, the other tress from behind threw a shadow down her calves, met gaze at her. And what dost thou hear now, O maiden? Asked Med. I impart to thee thine advantage and good fortune in thy gathering and muster of the four mighty provinces of Erin against the land of Ulster on the raid for the king of Coolgi. Wherefore dost thou this for me? Asked Med. Much cause have I, a bond made mid thy people am I. Who of my people art thou, and what is thy name? Asked Med. Not hard in sooth to say, the prophetess of Fedum, from the sea of Crucan, a poetess of Connacht am I. Whence comest thou? Uh, asked me. From Alba, after learning prophetic skill. The maiden made answer. Hast thou the form of the divination? Verily have I. The maiden said. Look then for me, how will my undertaking be? Maiden looked, then spake Med. Good now, tell old, fel 
O Feldom, prophet maid, how beholdest thou our host? Pedon answered and spoke. Crimson red from blood they are, I behold them bathed in red. That is no true augury, said Med. Verily, Conchabar with the Ulsterman is in his pains in Eamon. Thither fared my messengers, San brought me true tidings. Nor to say that we need to we need dread from Ulster's men. But speak, O truth, O Feldham. Tell, O Feldham, prophet maid, how beholdest thou our host? Crimson red from blood they are, I behold them bathed in red. That is no true augury. Cusgrave Mend, the stammerer of Machar, Conchabar's son, is in Innis, Cusgrave. In his pains, thither fared my messengers. Nought need we fear from Ulster's men, but speak truth, O Feldham, Fedelm. Hello, Fedelm, prophet maid, how beholdest thou our host? Crimson red from blood they are, I behold them bathed in red. Egan, Durchat's son, is in Rath Erthia. In his pains, thither went my messengers. Nought need we dread from Ulster's men. But speak truth, O Feldham. Tell, O Fedelm, prophet maid, how beholdest thou our host? Crimson red from blood they are, I behold them bathed in red. Kelchar, Uthchar's son, is in his fort at Lethglass in his pains, and a third of the Ulstermen with him. Thither fared my messengers. Nought have we to fear from Ulster's men. And Fergus, son of Roig, son of Eothaid, Il is with us here in exile, and thirty hundred with him. But speak truth, O Feldham. Tell, O Feldham, Bedelm, prophet maid, how beholdest thou our host? Crimson red from blood they are, I behold them bathed in red. Me seemeth this not as it seemeth to thee. Quoth me. For when Erin's men shall assemble in one place, their quarrels will arise and broils, contentions and disputes among them about, all, about the ordering of themselves in the van or rear, at ford or river, over who shall be first at killing a boar or a stag or a deer or a hare. But look again, look now again for us and speak truth, O Fedelm. Tell O Fedelm, prophet maid. How beholdest thou our host? Crimson red from blood they are. I behold them bathed in red. Therewith she began to prophesy and to foretell the coming of Cuchulain to the men of Erin, as she chanted a lay. Fair of deeds the man I see, wounded sore is his fair skin. On his brow shines hero's light, victory's seat is in his face. Seven gems of champions brave deck the centre of his orbs. Naked are the spears he bears, and he hooks a red cloak rounds. Noblest face is he, I see he respects all womankind. <coughs> Young the lad and fresh is hue, with a dragon's form in fight. I know not who is the hound, Coolin's height of fairest fame, but I know full well this host will be smitten red by him. Four small swords, a brilliant feat, he supports in either hand. These he'll ply upon the host, each to do its special deed. His gebulga too he wields, with his sword and javelin. Lo, the man in red cloak girt sets his foot on every hill. Two spears from the chariot's left he cast forth in orgy wild, and his form I saw till now, well I know will charge its guise. On to battles now he comes, if ye watch not, ye are doomed. This is how he seeks ye in fight. Brave Cahulan, Shultan's son, all your host he'll smite in twain, 
till he works your utter ruin. All your heads ye leave with him, Fedelm prophet made hides not. Gore shall flow from warriors' wounds, long twill live in memory, bodies hacked and wives in tears, the, through the smith's hound whom I see. Uh, again, I, I, you know, uh, uh, great applause. I think everyone did a w wonderful job. Um, uh, what? Uh, I see. I see. I'll, I'll stop share for a bit. Yeah. It's... <laughs> I want to make a remark. <laughs> so, sorry. Uh, I want to tell something. I, I think the the last poem was very of a very Scandinavian form. Mm -hmm. you, you, yes. You. Um, what what did what did um, uh, everyone think about the the, the two works? Uh, uh, the two extracts we we've had. I mean, I've, I found the first one very, very difficult to uh, follow. The, the second one was 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 far stronger in its basis in real events. What what what, what did people think? I, I felt uh, very. I agree with you what you said there, and I also felt that there was such a powerful rhythm or music to it that when uh, I had difficulty following. The plot following events because it was an outpouring of words almost mm. that could be it sounds bizarre to say almost like symbolist poetry because it was such a flood of words that one was carried away as one might be by by a, a classical symphony mm. and that was one thing that, that certainly struck me the other thing i would definitely say is that i can well understand that people believed it was translated from the gaelic simply because the language came up across to me at least as very much a good translation of something my impression my spontaneous impression um i i i, I must say frank rather frank i think you you read it with extraordinary rhythm uh, yes 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 flow. yeah I, absolutely musicality i i don't know whether that's your italian background but it, it was yeah uh, wonderful and I'm not, uh, I'm not, um, I must um, aver, I'm not really uh, keen on poetry. But I wanted to say, um, for me, um, yes, it's a sheer flow of words. Uh, the content, the actual meaning, uh, it just emerges from bits and pieces. For some reason, the words which stack out in my consciousness were not words which ultimately, presumably, important. For example, the word Alster. Today, Alster is not a word which the Irish would like. I mean, the Irish nationalists. Yeah. Well, yeah. Alster. I'm from Alster. Like... <laughs> well, I'm, from I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> I, maybe I put my foot in it, but I know yeah. some uh, Irish Protestant, uh, Irish Catholics who don't like the word. Yeah. Well, I, 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 can I just disagree there? Because I'm a well, well, I was an Irish Catholic, but I'm from one of the other counties of Ulster that's not in Northern Ireland. Right, right. I'm from Monaghan, and Monaghan is a very proud part of Ulster. Right. Um, okay. With the mythology. Well, so it's okay, okay. Uh, I, I, I stand uh, corrected. <laughs> the other thing is the name, which I don't know how to pronounce, the word which I pronounce, Kuchelain, but there must be a correct way. Now, Cochelaine is the name of a dog who's actually the mascot of the Irish Guards Regiment in London. Mm -hmm. When you go, go and see the change of the guards and when you get the Irish Regiment, sometimes you see this dog, Cochelaine, taken along with a parade. I, so I, 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 think it's, the music. I think it's Coo Cullen. Actually, Coo, Coo means Cullen, a dog okay. or a hound, like Key in Welsh is a dog, and Coo yeah, is the, Coo it's Cullen, the Irish Gaelic for dog, so it's the dog or the hound of Cullen. Coo Cullen. I, Cullen. I think Coo Cullen. Cullen. name because he had killed a watchdog and then he took That's, on yeah. the role of a, a, a watchdog. Okay. Okay. Who's the dog in Irish, you say? Coo. Coo. Mm -hmm. uh, that's uh, typical Indo European. It is uh, like a hound. Uh, nice. uh, 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 and hund in uh, German and kion in uh, in in Greek. Oh really? Uh, oh, yeah. Yes, oh. q is uh, the the root, mm. and uh, also the French. I think shen ah, from the yeah. same uh, root. Uh, so it's Indo European. Uh, uh, yes. what, what what did I mean? Did uh, oh my Michael? Yes, please. 
I just I wanted to give a, maybe an interesting aspect, uh, perspective from what I saw, especially with the names Svaran and Starno. Yeah. Which for me at least have a Slavic association, where Svaran is something like a person. The word Svar means like argument or fight. So it seems like it's a person who argues a lot. And Starno means something in the sense of aging or aged person. So maybe there is something connected to that, but the, just the first thing that came when I see this, like, okay, that sounds Slavic, uh, Svaran and Starno. Yeah. Uh, has anyone read a single word of the poems of Ossian before, or no? It, it, I've, 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 oh, come you know. I've come across them because I studied medievalism as part of my MA, and it was mentioned, and I was just talking about the, the style, particularly the first one. If you look at some of the the, the lesser known or the ones that are lesser considered lesser literary of the uh, medievalist texts. It's very similar to that. You know, if you compare it to like the writing of Ivanhoe, for example, from that time period, um, it's that flowery language that brought on the, that wrote romantic writing, the romanticism of, 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 of then, you know, sort of basing it because they tried to pretend it was a, a, a translation of earlier medievalist mm. texts from things like Old English or yeah. Medieval English. It's, it's interesting, the, the mm. style of the first one. Do you, I mean, when you mean now Ivanhoe, do you mean by Sir Walter Scott? Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, we, 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 we've, uh, uh, perhaps I, sh I should say, as, as uh, perhaps some of you may have uh, uh, subconsciously sensed, um, of the two extracts, the first was authentic uh, McPherson, but but the second was was not, um, and was in fact taken from the Cattle Raid of, of Cooley, one of the yes. most highly regarded uh, works of, of the Celtic canon. Um, historically, what what is now called myth or epic is what has resulted from a protracted process of person-to-person -person transmission, wherein a seed of a story grows, is pruned and grows again. This tends to winnow out meaningless phrases and excess verbiage. Uh, the story must have a robust narrative, otherwise it will be difficult to remember and to pass on. Um, the first extract seems to me more styled and substance, and in that sense, it's distinct from, from the second. Uh, there are references uh, and allusions in the second, lots of unfamiliar names, but there doesn't seem to me to be a sentence whose meaning is unclear. Uh, whereas the first one, lots of those sentences, honestly, I had no idea really what they meant. No idea. Um, Macpherson attends to passions, to battles, to sorrows, without much explanation as to the, to the reasons. He kind of adds words almost like colors, just, just to sort of give some uh, tone to something. If one will, he has a, 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 a very romantic view of things and his use of language is similar. Using it to create a mood rather than using language to describe what is happening, which itself should create the mood, which in a second is the case. Uh, Dr. Johnson considered McPherson uh, a mountebank, which means like a quack doctor selling things that don't really work or not genuine and of little talent on being asked, but Dr. Johnson, do you really think that any man today could write such poetry? Mm. His answer was yes, many men, many women and many children. Uh, and his typically withering judgment was to dismiss Ossian as being as gross an imposition as ever the world was troubled with. Uh, Macpherson may not be the equal of Homer, I think, but I, I would contend that he does have talent and an ear for the emotional nuance of words, but he was too beholden, perhaps, to the fashionable ideas of his time to make him an easy read for any but those steeped in the literature of this period. And given what we know of his work uh, now, that it is a confection, which his contemporaries did not, at first, it's much more difficult for us to take it seriously and to recapture that world conquering impression it, it must have made upon Goethe and even those of less discrimination. Um, 
So um, we've got to that stage where uh, I'll ask people whether, whether they, they want to conclude the first um, uh, extract uh, or, or, or not. What's, what's, what's the time? It's, you know, it's, uh, oh, I mean, I think we've been going for a, a little while. Um, yeah, do, do people want, want, I mean, that, that, that was the first of, uh, of, of, of three parts. The, um, do, would people like to continue with that or, or, or not, or, 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 or that was enough? I actually, I must admit, uh, what drew me to this subject was the cultural, uh, historical, and even revolutionary implications of uh, poetry of Ossian. Yeah. Um, his influence on uh, the romantic movement mm. of a nationalist movement arising in Europe of the time, mm. from Poland to Italy. And there was a great Italian poet, Ugo Foscolo, who was much influenced by Ossian. He was a patriot, a revolutionary, and actually he died in London and is buried in the cemetery of Chiswick Parish Church of which I was a curate a long time ago. So for me, it's the blend of romanticism, nationalism, and revolution, which makes Ossian interesting. As to the poetry, pass. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I mean, that, that is exactly, and uh, I, I, in, in organizing, I, I didn't wish to dwell too much on what you say, Frank, is it, the enormous influence of Ossian. It really was a phenomenon. It's difficult to, find something comparable. I mean, the, the only thing that could come to mind, which is a really lame example, is the Beatles. But I mean, I don't know. It, <laughs> it, it, it swept across the world. And uh, I, um, as I said, Thomas Jefferson said that he was the greatest poet that ever existed. I mean, it's, it's astonishing, astonishing. And there were so many paintings and um, pieces of music. I mean, Schubert set, set some of the poems and in, in all sorts of translations. And it, it, it was what the theories of people like Herder uh, talking about the importance of indigenous culture. It was what uh, kind of needed to, to, to be there for people to say, ah, oh, this is exactly what he was talking about. This is, this is wonderful and we must get back to this kind of rude authenticity. Um, yeah, it, it was this kind of uh, bare hook that people could hang their, their hopes on really. Uh, but the, the literature itself, I don't know, it, it, it is strange. But so I, 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 I get the impression that maybe um, there, there isn't a, a collective will to uh, drive on to, to, to the end of the uh, uh, of the um, uh, this particular poem. I think. And yes, Stefan. May, please. may I say something before I leave? Uh, I, I, I'm not uh, so uh, so much into the uh, English literature, and uh, I, uh, as you know, uh, it's apparent I'm not a native uh, English speaker. Uh, but uh, I think this is by far the most poetic piece in English, I, I have ever uh, come across. <laughs> oh, yes. really? Yes, I think so. And uh, I was in particular impressed by the, 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 the last piece, the last long uh, uh, poem, uh, which was read by the uh, lady, uh, the, uh, the young princess in, in, in the poem, uh, because it resembles so much something uh, I have here, for example, it is Saxo Grammaticus. Yeah. It's a, a very classic in, in Danish uh, literature. It was originally written in, in uh, Latin. Yes. Uh, 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 but uh, it was translated and it, it was some nice translations that were made um, some uh, 150 uh, up to 100 years ago. Mm. More than, uh, I, I don't give uh, a, a uh, not anything for for the modern translations. Uh, they are not ready. Mm. So, um, By Grundby, yeah. Yes. It is uh, uh, from uh, 19th century. Uh, uh, well, um, Stefan, it, it was the the second extract in particular that impressed you. Yes. Yeah. yeah. yeah I, and I, in particular, the the the, yeah. the the last part of it with the, that poem. Mm -hmm. because because it, it reminded me of some uh, some pieces from here uh, uh, when mm -hmm. a, a, a hero here uh, uh, called Sterkola, uh, mm -hmm. he uh, he when he was he wants to to speak against some people and before going to battle 
he 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 has some long poems, and mm. uh, uh, that reminded me uh, the the um, I mean, artist artistically, it reminded me of those. Yes, indeed. Um, greetings, Niels. By the way, yes, sorry you arrived a bit late, but uh, very nice to have you. And uh, it's nice to see people surrounded by by very. Uh, 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 um, handsome bookcases. Uh, that is always a good, a good sort of image, isn't it? Well, yeah, um, uh, yeah. No, the, the second uh, uh, um, extract was was very powerful. And uh, um, could, so, could, could we have you some uh, PDF form which you could uh, send? Yeah, uh, I, 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 uh, uh, it, it, it's available at a very good website called Sacred Text, something like .com or something. But Stefan, I'll, I'll, I'll send you a link. I'll, I'll do that. Thank you. Yes, yes. I'm yes. glad to have it. And by the way, Stead, I absolutely adored that um, piece of Albinoni, the Adagio, which Love for it. me, it's always, it's always had a tremendous uh, emotional impact. Yeah. And it was, I first heard it as part of a score of Orson Welles' a, a filmed version of Kafka's Betrayal. It always stuck in my mind. Oh, really? I, I would never have thought that music uh, would have been used in that way. Well, isn't oh. that interesting? But it, yeah, it, it, is a, it, it has great gravity, solemnity, and, uh, and power. And, I, you know, I think my... Um, I don't know whether I, I can't remember whether my mother said she liked that before, you know, she died, or whether we, we chose it. But it, it yeah, it, it, I'm sure it's uh, been used by uh, many people's funerals because it, it's it's a nice way to move from one one domain to the to, to the <laughs> other. Yes, absolutely. Um, so I, I, as to whether we continue, um, Michael, you, you are the... No, I, well, I have an absolutely open mind and uh, I, I'm happy to do so and uh, happy not to do so. Um, I, I certainly think that probably people have got a bit more to say about it so that we shouldn't read it if it means that we're going to lose time to talk about it. But I'm, I'm, I'm very happy to, to, to for a second reading. Maybe uh, take, take, I don't know about other people feel, but if I have a short break, <laughs> about two minutes... But that's also a suggestion. If we are going to have another reading, I mean, you know, that people get a cup of coffee or something. I, I think we might as well. I, I mean, it, 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 if no one said, I just can't take any more, I'm, I'm going, I'm, uh, if no one said that, I think <laughs> well, we they'll might... probably go in that case anyway. They're just sent. No, I, 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 I could take some more, but I got to go have some food. So I'm sorry, I got to love and leave you. <laughs> oh, okay, but, okay. but I, I, I love this session. Yeah, yeah, you, 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 you um, yeah, you contributed so much to it, and, and the flow, and the, 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 the musicality. So thanks, Frank, very much. Thank, thank you so much. much. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Yeah. But, 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 um, all right. So we, um, if if no one has any objections, let let let's let's just um, f finish off the poem. It's just two more parts. They're not that long. I I, I think we could do it in about twenty minutes or less, mm -hmm. frankly. So let's yeah. go that. Um, so that means we have another um, Ossian. Um, Ma Michael from Cologne. Um, we, we, yes, we do... but I mean, of course, the, with the daunting challenge of even trying to uh, reach the standard of the Ossian that we just heard. But um, <laughs> if people could uh, be understanding in that respect, yeah. Yeah, now I think... Um... Start, yeah, I, I, I get right. If, if, if you're Ossian, um, Niels, would you care to be Starno? You're ah, are you on mute? I can't hear you, I'm afraid. I don't know, I can't see the mute symbol, but ah, if we can't hear you, and now, yeah, now if you can oh, unmute yeah. yourself. Oh, I had that problem a few months ago. No, I'm sorry. I, uh, I'm sorry about that. It's, uh, um, um, oh, well, I, 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 yeah, I, sh I shall be, I, sh I shall be, be, be star now. Okay. Let's, let, let's see if we can uh, just sort of fin finish off. It shouldn't be long. Let's, let's go. Right. Second. Yes. Yeah, th third extract. Fingal, returning with day, dissolve, uh, uh, devolves the command upon Dath Maruno, who 
engages the enemy and drives them over the stream of Torthor. Having recalled his people, he congratulates Duth Muruna on his success, but discovers that that hero had been mortally wounded in the action. Duth Muruna dies. Ulin, the bard, in honor of the dead, introduces the episode of Colgorm and Strina Dona, which concludes the Duan. Now, uh, yeah, I, I, I realized that uh, I think I, I've double cast Michael from um, London in uh, Duth Muruna. Uh, Mick, would, um, would, would you care? No, I think. Uh, no, you're someone of. I think I'll have to be Dus. Yeah, um, yeah, I'm thinking who. Do, do we have any men that uh, are not assigned roles? Uh, I think I'll, I'll be Dus Maruno uh, because my, Michael uh, from London uh, will be Ulin. Right. Where art thou, son of the king? said dark-haired Dus Maruna. Where hast thou failed, failed young demon of Selma? He returns not from the bosom of night. Morning is spread on all thorn. In his mist is the sun on his hill. Warriors lift a shield in my presence. He must not fall like a fire from heaven, whose place is not marked on the ground. He comes like an eagle from the skirt of his squally wind. In his hand are the spoils of foes. King of Selma, our souls were sad. Near us are the foes, Doth Maruno. They come forward like waves in mist, when their foamy tops are seen at times above the low sailing vapor. The traveler shrinks on his journey. He knows not whither to fly. No trembling travelers are we. Sons of heroes call forth the steel. Shall the sword of Fingal arise, or shall a warrior lead? The deeds of old, said Das Maruno, are like paths to our eyes, O Fingal. Broad shielded Trenmore is still seen amidst his own dim years, nor feeble was the soul of the king. There no dark deed wandered in secret. From their hundred streams came the tribes to glassy cold land Krona. Their chiefs were before them, each strove to lead the war. Their swords were often half unsheathed. Red rolled their eyes of rage. Separate they stood and hummed their sourly songs. Why should they yield to each other? Their fathers were unequal, were equal in war. Trenmore was there with his people stately. In youthful locks he saw the advancing foe. The grief of his soul arose. He bade the chiefs to lead by turns. They led but they were rolled away. From his own mossy hill, blue-shielded Trenmore came down. He led wide-skirted battle, and the strangers failed. Around him the dark-browed warriors came. They struck the shield of joy. Like a pleasant gale, the words of power rushed forth from Selma of kings. But the chiefs led by turns in war till mighty danger rose. Then was the hour of the king to conquer in the field. Uh, Mick? Not unknown, said Cromaglass of Shields, are the deeds of our fathers. But who shall now lead the war before the race of kings? Miss settles on these four dark hills. Within it let each warrior strike his shield. Spirits may descend in darkness and mark us for the war. They went each to his hill of mist. Bards marked the sounds of the shields. Loudest rung Thy boss, Duth Maruno, thou must lead in war. Like the murmurs of waters, the race of Urthomo came down. Stano led the battle and Swaran of stormy isles. They looked forward from iron shields like Kruskyloda, fiery-eyed when he looks from behind the darkened moon and strews his signs on night. The foes met by Torthor's stream. They heaved like ridgy waves. Their echoing strokes are mixed. Shadowy death flies over the hosts. They were clouds of hail with squally winds in their skirts. Their showers are roaring together. Below them swells the dark rolling deep. 
strife of gloomy Uthurno, why should I mark thy wounds? Thou art with the years that are gone, thou fadest on my soul. Stano brought forward his skirt of war and swore on his own dark wing. Nor a harmless fire is Duthmaruno's sword. Lochlin is rolled over her streams. The wrathful kings are lost in thought. They roll their silent eyes over the flight of their land. The horn of Fingal was heard. The sons of Woody Albion returned. But many lay by Torthor's stream, silent in their blood. Chief of Crasmore, said the king. Dos Maruna, hunter of boars, not harmless returns my eagle from the field of foes. For this white bosom Lanul shall brighten at her streams. Candona shall rejoice as he wanders in Crasmore's fields. Colgorm, replied the chief, was the first of my race in Albion. Colgorm, the rider of ocean, through its watery vales. He slew his brother in Aethorno. He left the land of his fathers. He chose his place in silence by rocky Crasmo Crollo. His race came forth in their years. They came forth to war, but they always fell. The wound of my fathers is mine, king of echoing isles. He drew an arrow from his side. He fell pale in a land unknown. His soul came forth to his fathers, to their stormy isle. There they pursued boars of mist along the skirts of winds. The chief stood silent around as the stones of Loda on their hill. The traveller sees them through the twilight from his lonely path. He thinks them the ghosts of the aged forming future wars. Night came down on Uthorno, still stood the, chief, stood the chiefs in their grief. The blast whistled by turns through every warrior's hair. Fingal at length broke forth from the thoughts of his soul. He called Ullin of harps and bade the song to rise. No falling fire that is only seen and then retires in night. No departing meteor was he that is laid so low. He was like the strong beaming sun long rejoicing on his hill, called the names of his fathers from their dwellings old. I, Thorno, at the bard, thou risest midst richy seas. Why is thy head so gloomy in the ocean's mist? From thy veils come, came forth a race, fearless as thy strong winged eagles, the race of Colgorm of iron shields, dwellers of Lotus Hall. In Tormut Muff's resounding isle arose Lurthen, steamy hill. It bent its woody head over a silent vale. There at foamy Kruvath's source dwelt Rumar, hunter of boars. His daughter was fair as a sun, white bosomed Strinadona. Many a king of heroes and hero of iron shields, many a youth of heavy locks came to Rumar's echoing. Paul, they came to woo the maid, the stately huntress of Tormouth Wild. But thou lookest careless from thy steps, high bosom stream and donor. If on the heath she moved, her breast was whiter than the down of Cana. If on the sea beat shore, then the foam of the rolling ocean. Her eyes were two stars of light. Her face was heaven's bow in showers. Her dark hair flowed round it like the streaming clouds. Thou wert the dweller of souls, white-handed Strinadona. Colburn came in a ship, and Colburn of Surin, the king of shells. The brothers came from Ithorno to woo the sunbeam of Tormoth wild. She saw them in their echoing steel. Her soul was fixed on blue-eyed Corgon. Cor O'Loughlin's night the eye looked in and saw the tossing arms of Strinadona. Wrathful, the brothers frowned. Their flaming eyes in silence met. They turned away. They struck their shields. Their hands were trembling on their swords. They rushed into the strife of heroes for long-haired Strinadona. Corco Sorin fell, fell in blood. On his isle raged the strength of his father. He turned Colburn from Ithorno to wander on all the winds. In Krathmokralo's rocky field, he dwelt by a foreign stream, nor darkened the king alone, 
that beam of light was new, the door of echoing torment, white arm, screen of dawn. Ossian, after some general reflections, describes the situation of Fingal and the position of the army of Lochlin. The conversation of Stano and Swaran. The episode of Corman Trunach and Foyna Brag. Stano, from his own example, recommends to Swaran to surprise Fingal, who had retired alone to a neighboring hill. Upon Swaran's refusal, Stano undertakes the enterprise himself. He's overcome and taken prisoner by Fingal. He is dismissed after a severe reprimand for his cruelty. Whence is the stream of years? Whither do they roll along? Where have they hid in mist their many coloured sides? I look unto the times of old, but they seem dim to Ossian's <laughs> eyes, like reflected moonbeams on a distant lake. Here rise the red beams of war. There silent dwells a feeble race. They mark no years with their deeds, as slow they pass along. Dweller between the shields, thou that awakest the failing soul, descend from thy wall, harp of Kona, with thy voices three. Come with that which kindles the past, rear the forms of old on their own dark brown years. Uthorno, hill of storms, I behold my race on thy side. Fingal is bending in night over Dasmaruno's tomb. Near him are the steps of his heroes, hunters of the boar. By Tuatho's stream, the host of Lochlin is deep in shades. The wrathful king stood on two hills. They looked forward on their bossy shields. They looked forward to the stars of night, red wandering in the west. Cruth Loder bends from high like formless meteor in clouds. He sends abroad the winds and marks them with his signs. Starno foresaw that Morvan's king was not to yield in war. He twice struck the tree in wrath. He rushed before his son. He hummed a sourly song and heard his air in wind. Turned from one another, they stood like two oaks, which different winds had bent. Each hangs over his own loud rill and shakes his boughs in the course of blasts. An ear, said Starno of lakes. Was a fire that, <laughs> uh, was a fire that consumed of old. He poured death from his eyes along the striving fields. His joy was in the fall of men. Blood to him was a summer stream that brings joy to the withered vales from its mossy rock, only mossy rock. He came forth to the lake Luth Cormo to meet the tall Corman Truna. He from Orlo of streams, dweller of battle's wing. The chief of Orlo had come to Gormel with his dark-bosomed ships. He saw the daughter of Anya, white-armed Foyna Bragal. He saw her, nor careless rolled her eyes on the rider of stormy waves. She fled to his ship in darkness, like a moonbeam through a nightly veil. Anya pursued along the deep. He called the winds of heaven. Nor alone was the king. Stana was by his side. Like Uthorno's young eagle, I turned my eyes on my father. We rushed into Roaring Ulo. With his people came tall Corman Truna. We fought, but the foe prevailed. In his wrath, my father stood. He lopped the young trees with his sword. His eyes rolled red in his rage. I marked the soul of the king, and I retired in night. From the field, I took a broken helmet, a shield that was pierced with steel, Pointless was the spear in my hand. I went to find the foe. On a rock sat tall Corman Truno beside his burning oak, and near him beneath a tree sat deep-bosomed Foyna Braga. I threw my broken shield before her. I spoke the words of peace. Beside his rolling sea lies an of many lakes. The king was pierced in battle, and Stano is to raise his tomb. Me, a son of Loda, he sends to white-handed Foyna to bid her send a lock from her hair to rest with her father in earth. And thou, king of roaring Ola, let the battle cease till Anya received the shell from fiery-eyed Krutha Loda. Bursting into tears, she rose and tore a lock from her hair, a lock which wandered in the blast along her heaving breast. Cormantruna gave the shell and bade me rejoice before him. 
I rested in the shade of night and hid my face in my helmet deep. Sleep descended on the foe. I rose like a stalking ghost. I pierced the side of Cormantruno, nor did Foina Bragol escape. She rolled her white bosom in blood. Why then, daughter of heroes, didst thou wake my rage? Morning rose, the foe were fled like the departure of mist. Ania struck his bossy shield. He called his dark-haired son. I came streaked with wandering blood. Thrice rose the shout of the king, like the bursting forth of a squall of wind from a cloud by night. We rejoiced three days above the dead and called the hawks of heaven. They came from all their winds to feast on Ania's foes. Swaran, Fingal is alone in his hill of night. Let thy spear pierce the king in secret. Like Ania, my soul shall rejoice. Stefan? Is it me? Yes, mm -hmm. please. Uh, 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 oh, Holland. son of uh, Anu. Said Swaran. <clears throat> I shall not slay in shades. I move forth in light. The hawks rush from all their winds. They are going to to trace my calls. It is not harmless through war. Burning rose the rage of the king. He thrice raised his gleaming spear, but starting he spared his son and rushed into the night. By Torthos stream, a cave is dark, the dwelling of Conban Carglas. There he laid the helmet of kings and called the maid of Lulan, but she was distant far in Loda's resounding hall. Swelling in his rage, he strode to where Fingal lay alone. The king was laid on his shield on his own secret hill. Stern hunter of shaggy boars, no feeble maid is laid before thee, no boy on his ferny bed by Torthos' murmuring stream. Here is spread the couch of the mighty from which they rise to deeds of death. Hunter of shaggy boars, awaken not the terrible. Stano came muttering on, Fingal arose in arms. Who art thou, son of night? Silent he threw the spear. They mixed their gloomy strife. The shield of Stano fell, cleft in twain. He is bound to an oak. The early beam arose. It was then Fingal beheld the king. He rolled a while his silent eyes. He thought of other days when white-bosomed Agandisa moved like the music of songs. He loosed the thong from his hands. Son of Anir, he said. Retire, retire to Gormal of Shells, a beam that was set returns. I remember thy white-bosomed daughter, dreadful king, away. Go to thy troubled dwelling, cloudy foe of the lovely, let the stranger shun thee, thou gloomy in the hall. A tale of the times of old. So it concludes with Fingal being uh, magnanimous in victory and setting free Stano, who, whom he has uh, conquered. Uh, so he's, he's behaving with uh, what was at, at the time regarded as, a, as, a, as, a, as um, some degree of decency in, uh, in, 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 in that respect. And yet, I, I'm, I'm, I, I thank everyone uh, for allowing me to experience this, this, this text in a way that I hadn't when I read it alone. I, 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 it really has come to life with um, in, in, in the voices of people. So I thank everyone who's, who's read uh, a text that is not easy because of the very unfamiliar names. So you know, many, many thanks to, to everyone. And. Um, yeah, I, 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 the last bit went quite uh, um, quickly. I hope everyone's found this um, enjoyable and, and uh, informative. Really, uh, it, it does gives one a taste of some of something that, that had such a power in the past. I mean, now it, it, it doesn't seem to, to, to have retained it, but um, uh, at, at least we've actually read a, a, a whole unit of the poems of Ossian. Would, so. would, you, would you think, Stade, I was listening to that and I was thinking of the extraordinary influence, because um, I agree with you, it is extraordinary that um, Macpherson had, or should I say Ossian had, mm. could one perhaps regard him as a kind of seedbed, a sort of seedbed of inspiration 
that somehow he provided a raw stuff that inspired painters and musicians. Um, so I feel that very much uh, reading it, that at, at the same time, it's extremely good and extremely bad. Yeah. Um, it's extremely good in, the, in, in this joy of language, but it's extremely bad. And I can't see really what's happening. Some of the yes. metaphors are, are just simply comical, to be honest. And there's this sort of strange combination, I don't know how other people feel, of, of, of something very wonderful, but something also quite quite mediocre, if not awful. And uh, I, I find it very interesting. Because, uh, I mean, a, a lot of the, the sentences, um, I mean, I, I'm a native English speaker. And I, I really don't know what he means. Um, <laughs> well, that, that's an interesting point. Did he? I think he was trying to um, construct as a little bit like Sings with Playboy of the Western World. Was he not mm. trying to uh, create a syntax that he thought corresponded more closely to the Gaelic? Um, I can't directly give examples, but there were sentences that seemed, yeah. even for the 18th century, must have seemed quite mm. unusual and, and alien. But was I think his attempt to reflect this Gaelic syntax. We're putting the adjective at the beginning. I mean, I'm not a Gaelic speaker, but I know that they do that. Um, very difficult it is, instead of it is very difficult. Yes, whatever. Yeah. Um, uh, I, I mean, what, one of the lines I, I, I was reading, I almost read it wrongly because it, I thought it, it, he was saying, uh, now return the, the sons of Woody Allen, but it was a Woody, Woody Albion. <laughs> Well, that that was really prophetic, yeah. But um, uh, everyone is is doing something darkly. That the word dark yes. is used with no reference to um, the the amount of light or, or involved. I don't know. It's it, it, it is key. yes, yeah. Very valid. Michael from London. What was your your view? I mean, have you encountered this work before? Um, not really, no. But I was. I was kind of shocked by the the murder of the of the one opponent and the and the woman uh, while they're sleeping. Uh, that just struck me as really really strange. And and what type of a heroic tale is it supposed to be? If it's I mean he was he had been welcomed and he said everything was fine and then he kills them before they awake. Yeah yeah yeah. Yeah, no, yes. It was, well, what about the language? I mean, did you find it quite quite exciting and enjoyable to listen to, or was it irritatingly diffuse and kind of lacking? There are too many different names of, of characters that, I, that are totally unfamiliar, and so you get lost mm. in that. I was trying to follow the, the meaning rather than the, the, the metric. Yes, yes, indeed. Yeah. Um, just... Uh, uh, thanking Stefan for, for coming. Uh, oh, yeah, oh, yeah, you're still there. Yeah, thanks, Stefan. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, you, you uh, enormous, enormous respect for, for your being here. Did these texts are not easy at all for, uh, for, for, for a native speaker, let alone someone who, for whom it's, it's fifth or, or, or whatever. Sometimes, sometimes I combine with Scandinavian words or uh, German words to mm. uh, etymologically. I uh, understand, uh, intuitively understand what is uh, meant. But yes. It, it's going. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much, Stefan. Uh, uh, Linda, I mean, are you, are you familiar with much um, uh, Celtic literature, Gaelic? Uh, you know, I mean, are you, are, I mean, can you speak? Are you an Irish speaker by any chance? Um, only to a certain level. I, I had, we had to learn it for school oh, and then really? um, yeah. I've, I've spoken it a little bit since because I, I, worked, I worked in TV. Um, but um, yeah, I agree with the, the the whole idea of the creation of the syntax. It's really interesting because you do get some really bad translations of some of the Irish texts. You know, even like the Cattle Road of Cooley or the Ulster Cycle. I mean, you've got the accepted texts, which the ones that you would read, but there are some people who have attempted to translate, and they're really bad and similar to quite similar to this in the whole style and you know the, the syntax of it. So it is it is quite interesting and uh, the way it changes, you know, as you go did, along. Did you recognise in the uh, as Michael was suggesting in in the syntax that McPherson was was trying to yeah write some kind of a Celtic feel? Uh, I think he definitely was. You know, like you, you, like you're right. You just sort of say like. Something like you know, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm after going to the shop, so I am. You know, like it's like that, which means you have 
it means you've just been to the shops I'm after going in Irish means I've just been there yeah. you know and it's that it's sort of that that strange uh, 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 formation of, of sentences that I think he was trying to do Yes, um, I, sorry, it just occurred to me, because otherwise I'll forget. Sorry, excuse me to interrupt, but I think right. there's, there, there's no yes or no in that first text, mm -hmm. which is, of course, characteristically Celtic, that they don't have yes and no. And I, I, and, and it just occurred to me, I think, is there any yes or no in the whole text? Oh, really? That, that, it, it, it's, That's it, really interesting. It, it's <laughs> that, yeah, that, that, that is interesting, isn't it? Uh, there's no yes or no. Oh, really? Um, it, 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 it's, that, that's a feature of... of um, some Celtic languages, is it, Michael? I, I think all of them, yes. You uh, have to, it which is, is in Irish. I don't yeah. know about the other languages. Yes, it is. Yeah. It's the same in Welsh. Yes, yeah, and it's, uh, you, it's it's a good language learner's game when I teach English is to how long can they answer questions without saying yes or no? Because theoretically, you can always, you know, are you from Germany? I am. Do you speak English? I do, and so on. So you can always ask answer without yes or no. Mm -hmm. um, and the Celtic languages do that because I remember when I did learn a bit of Welsh. Um, Welsh trainer said, "If you've got any questions," and I said, "Yes." I said, "When, when are we going to learn yes and no? What, what is yes and no?" He said, "That's quite difficult. We'll do that in lesson five. I was quite <laughs> confused. <laughs> but in the same way, there's in Irish, there's no hello. You, you, there's just no mm. word for hello. You, you, your greeting is, if you say, it's just like God and Mary be with you, and they still they use that today as a as a as a hello. Mm. It's just accepted now as hello." So there's no hello and just a goodbye. It's a, a, a blessing upon you or a welcome upon you, things like that. Right. Yeah. Yeah. No, that, that, that's no, that, that that is interesting. Uh, yeah. It's always um, obviously he. I don't think was was directly translating something. I mean, it, 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 he was creating something rather than uh, doing that. But I, I mean, I know from old Norse tra translations, some of them try to follow the. Uh, syntax of old Norse and and produce things that are totally un-English and it, it, yeah it's very difficult to mm -hmm. do that but uh, I mean this 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 flowed and certainly in the mouth of um, of uh, Father Frank with it with his uh, was uh, great. Italian rhythm I mean he I mean yeah that's amazing, amazing. Um, yeah well, I, well, I, well, a question instead was was this person was he do you know a, a, a speaker of Gaelic he, he knew some Gaelic, but mm. but uh, a, a, a apparently not not very well. I mean, he he really did, yeah, uh, not, not not a good uh, Gaelic speaker. And the only um, text that uh, that any time seemed to have been uh, brought forward to show the the basis, I think, in, in in his lifetime was was actually something that had been back translated from his English into Gaelic by someone. I don't know. Yeah. Uh, it, 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 it does, it does see, see, see the chain, but as, as has been found, I mean, there are, uh, I mean, he does re re refer to uh, motifs that, that were present in Gaelic ballads that mm -hmm. I'm sure he, he, he would have known. And, uh, um, but uh, lots of the names, I think he seems to have invented, not, not Fingal and a few of them, but some of them are really very, very difficult. Uh, Linda, do, I mean, did you find the, Kind of phonology of, of the names actually less unfamiliar than some of us who've never encountered Gaelic. Some of them, some of them, I do, I do like. I think, like Michael said, that they, they sound quite Slavic. So, so some yeah. of the words were, I think, a, like a, a conglomeration, a mixture of Irish and probably Scottish. You know, that that they sort of a mixture of those things together. Yeah, and yeah they, they were quite familiar, but just sort of like a bastardization of sorts of words. But then others did sound quite Slavic. They didn't sound Gaelic at all. I don't know if that was intentional on his part. Yes, I mean, some of them just se seemed to be really totally m made up. They, they, they sounded like something from a science fiction or... or yeah, fan so some of them sounded like from Lovecraft, actually. <laughs> I was thinking, I was thinking yeah. like Lord of the Rings. From Mordor, you can't. Yeah. <laughs> Extra, extra points for that, I think. Uh, I, 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 it's interesting comparing him with uh, Tolkien, who, who did obviously create his own world, but you know, I think much more successfully, uh, of, of course. Um, but, um, Do you know much else about McPherson, about anything about his life and him and his wide um, works? And yeah, I, I, I'm just trying to think what he did as a, as a job. I mean, 
Mm-hmm. Uh, it, it seems that he wasn't a very agreeable character. I, 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 I think he was a politician, Stead. He might have been, yeah. I think he was a politician. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. He, he had a lot of good influential friends, I think. Was it, isn't he buried at Westminster Abbey? And he had quite uh, strong connections with some of the Scottish uh, literati. Uh, you know, uh, uh, um, he, he did come from quite a cultured milieu. Um, uh, but I, um, as I said, almost all of the discussion is of the, the cultural... F- Phenomenon, and it is good to actually look at the literature. But may, maybe um, uh, uh, there, is, uh, is there, there are areas of literature that perhaps uh, someone here was, would be interested in investigating similarly. So, uh, I mean, the, the idea of the, the, this club uh, uh, um, is it not, Michael, that you know, it should be to encourage the, the members to perhaps do a presentation on something that interests them. Definitely. And uh, uh, the next next meeting is, is a reading by me. And after that, I don't know if Stead has something up his sleeve, mm-hmm. but I don't. And so we, we would be very pleased, more than pleased to receive suggestions from, from members. I, I mean, I, I think that the main thing is that we have a certain amount of time to actually read texts. I completely um, agree with you. Yeah. Uh, so really, if one doesn't... Uh, and, and, this, and this can be to, to, to read them... Um, uh, you know, for, for, for the first time, you know, so one doesn't have to give a, a lengthy lecture about them. You know, one, one can just have some texts and we can put the, these up in a, um, in, in a form that everyone can see and, and, and read them and, and di- discuss them. So I, I perhaps let that thought sit with everyone. Uh, if there's something that uh, will we'll, um, um, come to you in, in due, due course, and we, we can do that. Um, but yeah, I th- thanks everyone for um, uh, attending. And um, yeah, Michael, would you like to like, close the, the meeting or, or make any more thoughts? All it? right. Well, yes, indeed. Thank you very much, um, everyone, for attending. I certainly hope uh, that you enjoyed it and profited from it, but well, both. <laughs> and um, anything that you want to say, you, you have either my email or Stead's or both of ours. Um, I, Next meeting will be next month will be the second part of my talk on the Faustian temptation, having a brief look at uh, Goethe and Thomas Mann and the the influence of the Faustian temptation on our culture and where we are. And yes, please, please, I could only second Stead's appeal if anybody themselves has any proposal or idea of something that they would like to present. Uh, please let us know uh, if you have any friends or contacts who you think might be interested in Sotoria, let us know. It's free, as they say, and it's still free. And what they say in Facebook will remain free or something. Um, yes. And yeah, and again, thank you very much for taking the time to come. Uh, just a, a brief uh, notice about Wednesday. Uh, the, there's a moot on Wednesday with Professor Ed Dutton. That will be on the same link. That will be starting at quarter past seven Wednesday. Uh, he describes himself as an anthropologist of religion and I'm sure that will be a, um, a, a suitably pungent and uh, fact-filled uh, disquisition about the benefits of um, religious practice. Uh, and, it, 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 and it should be highly entertaining, so I would re- recommend it and anyone to, to come. However, be 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 warned. I mean, he, he is not someone who uh, who will necessarily uh, um, uh, speak um, well heard conventional um, uh, platitudes, uh, uh, which is why he's such a uh, um, uh, a, a stimulating p- person to hear. I think. Um, so with, without further ado, yeah, yeah so yeah, perhaps we I hope everyone will have a very nice Sunday afternoon. We we still got some hours of daylight to go out and stretch our legs and uh, see the sun. So uh. Th- thank you, Stead. That was uh, yeah, thank you. excellent. Great thank event. You, thank you. Thanks. Uh, oh, cheers. I'll close it. Cheers, Michael. Bye. Cheers. Bye-bye. Bye bye. Bye everybody. Thank you very much. Bye. Thank you. Bye. bye. bye.